Um, I'm really honored tonight. Uh, I've had the chance just a, a little bit earlier to meet our guest of honor and our distinguished speaker, Gary Rogers. Um, Gary uh, has had a very exciting 2015 so far, and I, I hope he'll uh, share some of his, his business lessons with us tonight. Uh, Gary is the immediate past chairman of Safeway Incorporated and former chairman also of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, just around the corner, and Levi Strauss and Co. Um, uh, for coming from UC Davis, which has such a, a, a strong connection to sort of food and ag, it's a particular honor to be introducing Gary tonight. Uh, Gary has really been an icon in the food industry. Uh, he was former chairman and CEO of Dryer's Grand Ice Cream, uh, and then uh, that he acquired that as, sm as a small 30-employee company, and it became one of the largest ice cream companies in the world with 8,000 employees. Uh, he was named chairman of Safeway more recently in 2013 until just last month when a truly monumental deal was completed that he was involved in. Uh, Safeway was acquired for $10.4 billion by a private investment group combined with Albertsons grocery stores, um, which is why I say he's had a very interesting 2015 so far. Uh, Albertsons, uh, the, the group will now become the nation's second largest grocery store spanning 2,200 stores, 27 distribution facilities, and 19 manufacturing plants uh, with more than 250,000 employees. So congratulations on a very successful merger. Uh, uh, Gary has done many other things. He also currently serves as director of Shorenstein Properties, Stanislaus Food Products, and I know he'll uh, be proud to mention the University of California San Francisco Medical Center. Uh, he's received many, many honors for both his, his uh, work in business as well as his, his other interests. Uh, he has been inducted into the Bay Area Business Hall of Fame, uh, has uh, been a Harvard Business School Leader of the Year, and a Wharton Business School Joseph Wharton Award recipient. Uh, he has also been named, uh, he served as an executive in residence at Harvard and Washington State University, and truly importantly, I know from talking with uh, Gary tonight, he has received the University of California Bear of the Year Award. Uh, Gary has a bachelor's degree, as you might now have guessed, from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Uh, he graduated there as a George F. Baker Scholar. Uh, he is a member, we were talking earlier tonight, the advisory committee uh, to the UC Regents Investment Committee, so all of us thank him for that service, uh, especially, and serves on the UC Berkeley Chancellor's Executive Advisory Council. Uh, Gary has also been importantly involved in numerous public service positions and is the benefactor of the Rogers Family Foundation, which supports a number of uh, a wide range of charities in education, health, and athletics. So that is, I could go on about <laughs> Gary, but I will not. I will let you hear from him directly. Uh, please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Gary Rogers. Well. Who is that guy? <laughs> I mean, I'm getting to the age where my memory fades. I don't remember half that stuff that, that Ann described. I guess I've been a busy guy. Um, but we did get that deal done. And you know, when you, when you have a deal that the government's looking at for over a year, and you know that time kills all deals, uh, you just pray every night that you know, we'll get the approvals done and that the wire transfer will take place and you can rest easy. Well, it happened about 10 days ago, so I'm not exactly resting easy, but it's, it's better than it was. So thank, thanks, Ian, for that kind introduction. Um, and let me just support, you know, I mean, we all have to support the institutions that supported us, and it's clear just sitting here, and, and from what I know about the, the Graduate School of, of Management at Davis, that, you know, you're all building a great institution, and that always takes teamwork, and I know all of you, the very fact that you're here tells me that you're supporting it, but we, we all need to give back to those things that gave to us when we were in need of a little inspiration. But now, as you can tell from Ann's introduction, it's been a busy 40 years. Um, I've spent it you know, trying, striving, to build successful enterprises across a pretty broad spectrum of businesses, mostly food and food-related, 
but it, it gives me a lot of grist to choose from when I, I try to get organized against what the assignment that Ann gave me to do tonight, which is to try to draw some lessons learned from all that. Um, and I will endeavor to share some of the experiences that I've had as I've come down this long road and, and uh, maybe say something that will in some way be helpful to those of you that are you know, coming along many years behind me. Um, as we go through this, I will, I will stop from time to time and we'll have a little case study where I'll ask you to volunteer what you would do were you me at that circumstance. Um, that'll be kind of fun. Um, and uh, so here we go. Um, my very first business venture went broke. You know, here I was, as Ann told you, a, a Harvard Business School graduate. I had worked for the vaunted management consulting firm of McKinsey. I really thought I, you know, understood how this business stuff worked. And I left with a partner and we went out and we were going to build a nationwide restaurant chain. And we opened three restaurants here in California and two in Texas. And we just flew right into the wall. I mean, we made some just horrible misjudgments. We were trying to sell Chardonnay and abalone to Texans that wanted chicken fried steak and red, white, or pink. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's truly how bad it was. So I, I came back home and licked my wounds for a while. It was a great humbling experience. And I, I still wanted to run an enterprise. Even though we had failed, we had had a, a great time failing. Maybe that was the problem probably drank too much wine, but, um, <laughs> but I, I wasn't ready to go back to work for somebody else yet. I mean, I was, I was still employable, but I, didn't, I really didn't want to do that. So I was literally you know, going around the Bay Area trying to meet people, putting myself in the, you know, the quote, deal flow to see if I could find something that I could do. I was flat broke. We were down to $2,000 in the bank. My wife was saying, how are we going to meet the mortgage payment? Um, we had, I think by that time, we had four kids under the age of seven, so I mean, I, I had to be responsible. But anyway, it's a long story, but I was introduced to a fellow by the name of Ken Cook, who was the then owner of Dryer's Grand Ice Cream. He had acquired it from the son of the founder. And the company at that time was 50 years old, or 48 years old, but it only had 30 employees. It was, it, its revenues were about $6 million a year. But, you know, I, I just, along with many, many other people, I looked forward to the opportunity to meet this man that was running a business in, in my town. And I was shown into his office, and we were just exchanging pleasantries, and the phone rang. And I offered to excuse myself, and he said, no, no, he had to stay there, and he took the call. And I could tell it was a very important call. And when he hung up the phone, he had tears in his eyes. And, and again, I started to move for the door. And he said, let me tell you what just happened. He said, that was Wells Fargo Bank. It's always been our bank. And he said, I desperately need a loan <clears throat> to keep this company going. And they just turned me down. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Now, this is the owner CEO of this little ice cream company meeting the total stranger, being that you know, forthcoming, tears running down his cheek, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Now, if you were me in that circumstance, what would you say to this man? Don't be bashful, hands up, come on. <laughs> yeah. First, be compassionate, and second, I mean, you have this skill set coming out of the Harvard Business School Okay. Other ideas? Yeah. How much do you need? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've got 2,000 bucks. You know. Yeah. I think he needed more than that. Yeah. Understand what he wants to do with the money. Is it to make it for payroll? Is it for what purpose is he trying to do with it? You got one more up here. It's, it's just be it. You, you have your hand up. Yeah. Sir, why don't we get you a loan? Say again? Okay, you know, this is so typical. I've done this before. <laughs> you guys know I bought the company, 
Ann just told you that. And here you are worrying about him. I'm your speaker tonight. <laughs> what about me? I blurted out the words that changed my life. I said, have you ever considered selling the company? And he said, no, not till just now. <laughs> and two days later, I had an option to buy his company for a million dollars. I had 60 days to exercise the option. I didn't know anything about the ice cream business. I had no idea really what the history of the company was. Yeah. Nothing. And so, um, I, you know, I found out in the course of this conversation that there was nothing magic about the million dollars. It's just what he had always wanted to have. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, you know, I was pretty excited about this. And um, he asked me, he said, how are you going to pay me? I said, oh, I'll give you a check. <laughs> I didn't lie to him. I didn't tell him it would be my check, okay? So I did my due diligence, and it was really pretty easy to raise a million dollars. I went to Wells Fargo Bank, and they gave me a half a million. And I went to this, what you, today you'd call a private equity firm in New York, and raised the other half a million in equity. Even in those days, that wasn't that much money. And the deal I did was, a private equity company would get half the ownership, and I'd get the other half for nothing. Not a bad deal, right? So the, 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 the message here, the first suggestion that I have for you in terms of lessons learned is prepare to be lucky. You know. I, I did my due diligence. I exercised that option. I gave him a million dollars, for which he was very grateful and happy. He stayed on and worked for me for a while. Four years later, we took that company public for $30 million. And 20 years after that, we sold it to Nestle for $3.2 billion. And those were big numbers in those days. <laughs> But um, I, I can't, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I gotta I, I got keep going or I'm gonna run out of time. But I'll, we'll have other opportunities, okay? And I'll take any questions we want at the, at the very end for sure. Um, so we built the company, as Ann said, into the largest ice cream company in the United States. We, you know, we moved from 30 employees to 8,000. I mean, it was, a, it, was, it was like a bookend. I mean, my first experience was this huge disaster. My second experience, if you run an IRR on it, we made 42% per year for 25 years. And of course, my returns were infinite because I didn't have any investment. So you know, people hearing that story now, though, say, boy, were you lucky to meet Ken Cook. But what I've learned, my favorite quote now, is what Louis Pasteur said. He said, prepare to be lucky. He said it a little, a little differently. He said, fortune favors only the prepared mind. Fortune favors only the prepared mind. The emphasis in that sentence is on only. Okay? And in my experience, I've learned that many, many people who are considered lucky in retrospect were really prepared to see that stream of opportunity that all of us see every day and be able to recognize it, sorry, um, and act on it and leverage it and know what to do when you, you run into these kinds of situations like I just described. I, would, now, I didn't know that that specific thing was going to happen. I certainly didn't go in there with the idea of buying this guy's company. But I knew what to do when the opportunity came up. And that changed my life. You know, I don't know if any of you were Boy Scouts, but you know, the, the Boy Scout motto is be prepared. I was a Boy Scout, and I certainly knew that motto, but I never had the idea that that motto was going to be so important in my life. Be prepared 
Fortune favors only the prepared mind. All right. Second lesson learned. You know, this buzzword of sustainable competitive advantage, I know you've all heard about it. But if you're in any business, you've got to be able to offer your customers or your clients something that your competitors can't offer. And you need something that's sustainable and that's an advantage that, that, that you can apply against your business so you can succeed where others are going to fail. And there are a lot of ways to get there. I mean, I've seen a lot of examples of sustainable competitive advantages that come from all sorts of places. But you need one. Now, when I bought Dryer's ice cream, I didn't know anything about the ice cream business. But, I, but here again, I was, you know, I was ready to move forward. And one of the things I learned in my due diligence was that all the big grocery chains operated these ice cream warehouses, and everybody that sold ice cream to them sold into the warehouse, and the grocery chain loaded up this big 40-foot truck and delivered the ice cream to the store and stocked the shelves. And, you know, it didn't take much of a brain to realize that that would be a lot more efficient and cheaper than running a fleet of trucks around yourself and, and, and handling your own distribution and your own store stocking. But I knew that dryers hadn't done that. And Ken Cook took, took me out behind the factory and he showed me one of their trucks. They had about a dozen trucks like this, you know, probably 20 years old. And he said to me, Gary, don't sell the trucks. He didn't explain why. He just said, don't sell the trucks. And I was thinking, this is crazy. I mean, why, why would you be driving a truck like that around where you can take a 40-foot truck to a warehouse and serve a whole chain like Safeway? But because I had gone broke in my previous venture, I wasn't as cocky as I had previously been. And I thought to myself, maybe I shouldn't ignore the number one piece of advice that the former owner gives me, at least not too quickly. So we started, we kept the trucks. We, over time, we upgraded them a little bit. But this became the sustainable competitive advantage that drove this huge financial success. Anybody want to venture a reason why? Advertising. Advertising on the side of the truck? Yeah, OK. Yeah, let's give that a maybe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and why is that important? Yeah, I mean that that's a big deal, okay? I mean, the first the first the first reason for doing this was quality. We were selling a quality product. And if you can imagine a, a grocery clerk getting a truckload of ice cream from the warehouse and having to stock, you know, pallet loads of ice cream, they'll sit there on the floor of the grocery store early in the morning while he stocks the cabinet and melt. And a quality ice cream, as I'm sure all of you have experienced, if it melts and then refreezes, is not very good. And there was no way we could control that as one little tiny player in this great big industry. So, I mean, that was something that wasn't obvious to me at first, but I learned as we went down the road. And then secondly, you know, as has been pointed out here, by having your own people in the stores, It's amazing what you can do. I mean, we learned that, that you know, in, in any store, people are overworked. And stocking ice cream, your hands get cold. And you can leverage that by having a nice, friendly route salesman. We didn't call them drivers anymore. They were route salesmen. Going in there and saying, you know, there's a, there's a part of your shelf here that didn't get stocked by somebody else. Why don't we just take care of that for you? <laughs> Or here's a pair of freezer gloves for your hands. You know, maybe they won't get so cold. And here's a baseball cap for your kids. And, I mean, you can build relationships. And, you, and there's no way from headquarters anybody can, can you know, overlook what this grocery clerk is doing. And just by interpersonal relationships, it's amazing what you can do. And we learned that our sales was proportional to the amount of space we had in the stores. 
And over time, we were always overspaced in every market. So then the third thing that happened is these route salesmen were all paid on commission. And they got very good at understanding which flavors sold in which stores. And you'd be amazed at what a difference there is. You know, I could take you to a Safeway store over here that sells nut and, and chocolate flavors like crazy, but doesn't do a very good job with vanilla or strawberry. And go over here, and the plain flavors like vanilla and strawberry sell really well, but the chocolate and nut flavors don't. And again, there's no way from headquarters that any you know, headquarters person can draw schematics for every store that reflect those kind, every store that reflects those kind of preferences. But this guy, his paycheck depended on it. So we got really smart about that. And then we, we got the big banana. We had this huge idea. And these things sound kind of simple. This is a simple industry, OK? But I've already quoted the numbers that you know, we were able to achieve through doing these simple things a little bit better. We went to our, our grocery customers, and we said, I'll tell you what, we'll sell you on consignment. You know, this invoice process we go through, where your truck pulls up to the back dock, you got to have your guy come out, count the ice cream, sign off on the invoice. That's time consuming for you, it's time consuming for us. Why don't we just do this? We'll stock the store. And you won't have any obligation to us at all until our product goes over your scanner. And then you pay us next the following Monday for everything that goes over your scanner for a week. So when you buy the product from us, you are instantaneously selling it to your consumer. They like that a lot. Sure. Not too many realize that the working capital actually came our way because we were previously selling them on a net 30 basis. And if you do the math, you know, we gained at least a week of working capital. But that, that wasn't the driver here. The driver was the information, because the basis for our transaction was now the scanner data. So they would give us the scanner data. Now we knew not only what we had sold in the store, which we knew before, now we know what the store sold by every SKU, by every flavor. And we could easily compute what the inventory in the store was at all times. So we could stock our trucks based on what the store needed. And many times, if a store didn't need service, we could drive right by it, you know, like UPS does. We'd, re we'd re route our system every day. That was an incredible advantage. And you can imagine how it increased our efficiency and our profitability. So you know, I mean, sometimes these sustainable competitive advantages can be fairly simplistic things like this, but they can be hugely important in a business. This allowed us to, to be a distributor for other products. Very few people know this, but I approached Ben Cohen, the owner of Ben & Jerry's, when they were just coming out of Vermont and entering Boston as their first major market. And I said, look, let us be your distributor. You can keep your own image, you can do your own marketing, you can all this stuff, but let us be your distributor. And as we go across the country with our product, which we call a premium product, we will also handle the distribution for your super premium product. And we did that. So we were, the, we were the national distributor for Ben & Jerry's as it grew. And we were able to leverage what we had built that I've just described for Ben & Jerry's as well. It was, it was a very simpatico relationship. So, um, you know, it, it, the advantages just you know, kept, kept building. And, um, and the point is that you know, we had a, a very clear advantage that none of our competitors had. And that's what allowed us, I think, you know, that was one of the things that allowed us to succeed to the extent we did. Pretty simple. I have another story for you. I was on the board of a, of a wine company that um, when I was on the board, it was called Franzia. It's now called the Wine Group. But this was a struggling wine company that was selling really low-priced jugs of wine against Gallo. And let me give you some advice. You never want to compete with Gallo, <laughs> especially in their backyard. I mean, they are really tough. They are really a good enterprise. But this guy was struggling along trying to sell jugs of wine against Gallo. And we weren't, we, I was on the board. We weren't doing very well. And then we learned that Gallo had just committed to build a glass plant 
They were going to start with sand, make glass, and pour or blow whatever you do your own bottles. They've used so many bottles that they were going to make their own bottles as an efficiency move. And they did. They, they, they spent $150 million to build this facility. And we said, aha, here's our opportunity. We started to sell bag-in-the-box wine. And for 10 years, Gallo didn't respond because they had this huge investment in the glass plant. And guess which became the best-selling wine in America? By gallons, not by dollars. Franzia. And to this day, Franzia. Franzia bag-in-the-box wine is the best-selling wine in America. <laughs> because the CEO and, and the, those of us that were advising them came up with this idea that was a clear, sustainable advantage against our key competitor because they made themselves vulnerable because now they were so dependent on their ground glass plant. Okay? So there are a lot of ways you can skin this cat, but um, you gotta skin the cat one way or the other. Be a persistent optimist. You know, Woody Allen said famously that 80% of success is just showing up. And I subscribe to that. That's the persistence part, okay? And it's, it's so often true, but just by showing up, you show up often enough, something good's gonna happen. But I contend that if you add optimism to the mix, it's more like 90%. I'm a great believer in optimism. There's a famous venture capitalist, some of you may have heard of by the name of Reed Dennis, who was an early venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. And he used to say, in all my years of venture capital, I've never met a rich pessimist. So the even better way, the, 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 the way of stating this same point that has affected my life probably more than anything else that anyone ever taught me was my crew coach at Cal. I rode on the crew there. And the crew coach used to say, there's no such thing as can't, there's only won't. There's no such thing as can't, there's only won't. And let me tell you, those are words to live by. He meant it more in a physical sense, in terms of, you, you know, you can do so much more physically than you think you can do. You can put so much more on that ore than you think you can do. You're really not as tired as you think you are. You're not going to die. But he also meant it in a you know, more of a, of a universal sense. And I have been in circumstances throughout my career where all of my advisors, all of my friends were saying, Gary, you can't do it. And it would trigger that, there's no such thing as can't, there's only won't. <laughs> Jim Lemon taught me that. I've just not, haven't figured it out yet. You know, when, when I went through Cal, I, I was in ROTC, as a lot of us were. It was the way we avoided the draft in those days. So I, when I got out of Cal, I had to do two years in the Army as a, as a lieutenant. But I had a friend who was too big for the Army he was an engineer like I was at Cal, and he went on to the Harvard Business School. So at some holiday party or something, I ran into this guy. He'd been, he'd been there for one semester. And he got me in a corner, and he said, Rogers, whatever you do, you've got to apply to the Harvard Business School. This place is made for you. You've just got to apply to the Harvard Business School. I really wasn't interested. I mean, I'd been trained as an engineer. My dad had been an engineer. I, wasn't, I didn't have any money, you know. But I said, okay, you know, and so I had a lot of free time in the Army, so I filled out an application, and son of a gun, I was accepted. It was amazing. So I went to my parents, who had put me through undergraduate you know, engineering school, and I said, I'm going to the Harvard Business School. And they said, well, fine, but you're doing it on your own, you know. We, we've paid for your education, and it was good enough for your dad, it'll be good enough for you, period. And we've always planned on you being an engineer, just like your dad was. So I went to the financial aid office at Harvard, and I said, you know, I understand that you have this policy that no one should be denied the business school for financial reasons, and here I am. And they said, well, we'll see if we can't help you, but your, your family has to submit an income statement and a balance sheet. So I took those to my dad, and he refused to fill them out. He, he, he was, I don't mean to put my dad down. He wasn't being nasty, really, but he just felt I was married, I was out, I was on my own, he was no longer you know, responsible for me. And so Harvard 
told me they couldn't help me. So by that time, we had moved back there. Um, we were so naive, we thought, you know, somehow we're going to make this work. I mean, once again, I, I was down to about three, at this time, I think I had $3,000 in the bank. But the tuition, even then, was $2,500 a semester. You, as you guys know, you can't go to business school and work. It's very difficult. My wife had a teacher's credential here in California. She said, well, I'll teach back there in Massachusetts, and we'll get through. I said, okay. So we got, went back there. We, bought the, we rented this very cheap apartment, and we you know, sort of figured we could make it work. And then she found out that the California teacher's credential doesn't mean anything in Massachusetts. You have to have a Massachusetts teacher's credential. So there we were, okay? And you know, the, the, the funds were going out, the what meager funds we had, and my friends were saying, Gary, you can't do it. You know, you're going to have to drop out and come back another year, you know, whatever. And those words kept going through my head. There's no such thing as can't. There's only won't. Well, like any good business school student, and I'm sure all of you went through this at the same time, you you'd get the Wall Street Journal every morning. I used to get the Wall Street Journal early on my porch there in Boston. And you know, I noticed that in the Wall Street Journal in those days, they'd publish earning re earnings reports kind of for everybody. And y you could get earnings reports for even over-the-counter companies. And I had this idea that maybe if an over-the-counter company had a really good earnings report, that by the time it was reported in the Wall Street Journal, there would still be some news value in it. I know that's hard to imagine in today's day. But trust me, I'm going to tell this story. So I put these you know, companies, these little companies that had doubled their earnings or more, and put them through a screen so they'd throw out the sports, you know, if they'd earned $1,000 this year and $500 a year before, that obviously didn't count. And if, if, if a company made it through my screen, I would call my broker down there in Boston and I would buy like $300 worth of stock. And I had a portfolio of eight to 10 of these and we would automatically sell them 10 days after we bought them. And I was doing this on a perpetual basis. It didn't take a lot of time in the morning to look through and pick out the stocks that might make this, put it through the screen, and if one got through the screen, we'd buy it. Son of a gun, it worked. I mean, I can't tell you how it worked. When I graduated from the Harvard Business School, this had been my only source of income. I had all my bills paid and $50,000 in the bank. There's no such thing as can't, there's only won't. Let me tell you one more quick story. When we were building our ice cream company, you know, our, our mission was to be the leading premium ice cream company in the United States. We started in the West and we moved eastward. And we had a lot of success in Western markets, that some, of, some of whom were aware of dryers, but, but I, I think we did a lot of things right, including direct store delivery. And then as we got you know, to the Rocky Mountains, we had this problem because there's this other company called Briars that had a, had a history very similar to ours, but the, I mean, the founders didn't know each other. It wasn't like it was a copycat thing, but they had a national trademark and we didn't. So I came to an agreement with, by that time it was Kraft that owned Briars, and I agreed that we wouldn't use the Briars name outside of the 13 Western states. So we had to be Edie's. Joe Edie was Bill Dreyer's partner, so it seemed like a natural thing to, to do. And we became Edie's in the Midwest and then in the East and the South. And so we were rolling, you know, we went into Chicago and St. Louis and Minneapolis and Washington, D.C., Baltimore. But up on the horizon was this great big monster called New York. And New York is the biggest ice cream market in the world. And trust me, it's a jungle. I mean, it's a jungle. I knew that even then. But I thought, you know, this is going to be tough. So I'm going to go do it myself. I'm the CEO, you know. I've got to go do it myself. So I got appointments with all the ice cream buyers of the big grocery chains in New York. And, and one by one, I went and met with them and talked about stocking Edie's Grand Ice Cream. And they said, Mr. Rogers, we have 20 half gallons of ice cream in this market. We only need six. Nobody knows Edie's. Nobody's ever heard of Edie's. So you know what? You're not going to be able to get this thing going. I mean, just, just to advertise a product like that in the New York market will cost you $10 million a year. 
even if we were to put you into our stores, we'd charge you what they call slots, which would be $6 million a year. And, you know, it, it just isn't going to work. And besides that, you know, when I mentioned that we were direct store delivery, they just laughed at me. They said, we don't have any direct store delivery in the Big Apple. I mean, everything gets sold through the warehouse. So there goes my, you know, sustainable competitive advantage in that market. And then somehow I mentioned that we were non-union. And this guy laughed at me. He said, go back to California, sonny boy. We don't, <laughs> we don't have non-union trucks on the streets of New York. Nobody does that. You're crazy. Go, you know, do your research. So I came back to California with my tail very much between my legs. And I thought about some of these things, and I kind of, you know, decided what we could do and what we couldn't do. And, you know, I decided, I'll go back, I'll talk to him again. So I tried to get appointments. I'm the CEO of the biggest ice cream company in the United States. I tried to get appointments with these ice cream bars. None of them would take my appointment. None of them. They didn't want to hear from me again. <laughs> it's pretty humbling. So I'm scratching my head. I'm saying there's no such thing as can't. There's only won't. OK, now I'm going to tell you a story that is absolutely fact-based. And when I've told this story sometimes in the past, I've been told that it's offensive. I don't mean to offend anybody, OK? Please. But we had in our sales staff at Dryers another Harvard Business School graduate who was th the number three person in sales, a woman. And she had been really successful in helping us enter other you know, handling the sales strategy for other markets as we've gone, gone east with Edie's. And she was young and she was attractive. I said, Rhonda, you've got it. You're in charge. Go sell Edie's in New York. And so she got on a plane and when she went back there. She was persistent, but she got appointments with everybody. And then she could get another round of appointments. And she was really smart about how she did it. She didn't go in there and try to sell these. She went in there with ideas on how to improve the category and how to do better lighting in the ice cream aisle. And you know, she, you know, she gradually earned her spurs with that tough set of ice cream buyers back there. And before I knew it, you know, a little bit of Edie's was showing up at some of these chains. Three years later, we were the leading ice cream of any kind in the New York market. Amazing. There's no such thing as can't. There's only won't. There's always an answer. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out, but there's no such thing as can't. Okay. I'm going backwards. Huh? Never learned this high tech stuff. Okay. From the mud grows the lotus. I mean, I've already told you about some disappointments I've had in my career and how, you know, we went broke in the restaurant business and we rebounded to have this big success in the ice cream business. You know, I've had other failures. And I, th I think you need to look at failure as a learning experience. I mean, there's really nothing new in some of this. But it's amazing in my career how often my biggest disappointments have led to my biggest successes. And one that comes to mind is that as we were building dryers, we, we wanted very much to acquire Ben & Jerry's. And I told you how we got Ben & Jerry's into our distribution system. I mean, it was like, you know, it's like we owned part of them already. They were making good money on that, but so were we. And we didn't have a so-called super premium ice cream. So I worked really hard to professionalize Ben & Jerry's. I got Ben to step aside. They brought in a, you know, a serious CEO there by the name of Bob Holland. Um, I, I encouraged them to go public, which they did. And, you know, and then I encouraged them to put their company up for sale. And I thought, boy, I got the inside track on this one. I knew, I knew the company better. I knew the players. I mean, we, we ought to be able to come to a deal. Well, guess what? At the last minute, 
my arch rival, Unilever, who owned Briars, outbid me. And Ben and Jerry's went to Unilever. I was so depressed. I mean, I was just, I'd spent, you know, probably a year working on this, and it all came to naught. But had we done that deal, there is no way we could have done the Nestle deal. Nestle owned Hagen Dazs. And Hagen Dazs and Ben and Jerry's together have about 90% of the super premium ice cream business in the United States. There's no way the FTC will allow us to make that combination. So, you know, that, that kind of says it all. Um, you know, life goes on. <laughs> get up and get back on the horse. Good things will happen. From the mud grows the lotus. Okay, hire smart. This sounds pretty pedestrian. I know all of you would say that when you're going to hire somebody, you want to be smart about it. But in my experience, very few companies really hire smart. And in my experience, you have choices when you put a, a team together. You can either hire smart or you can manage tough. If you hire smart, you don't have to manage tough. If you don't hire smart, you're going to have to manage tough. And I'm here to tell you it's a lot easier to hire smart than it is to manage tough. And if you hire smart, all the other issues go away. And when I say hire smart, what I mean is anytime you're hiring, especially in an executive position, you need to understand what the top 20% of all qualified applicants for that position look like. So you know you're hiring someone out of that pool. Top 20% of all qualified applicants. You let people from inside the company apply, but you also look at people from outside the company. I'm not a believer in, in promote from within. I think it over time breeds mediocrity. Inside people obviously are considered, but there's, they, they shouldn't get an advantage. You can, I mean, there's so many myths about reference checks. You can get reference checks. I have never yet hired somebody that I haven't been able to do a reference check on. And you should do criminal checks, and you should do drug checks, and you should, you know, when you think it's appropriate, send a candidate to a psychologist. I mean, there's just, they, they, we put people through 10 interviews sometimes before we made a decision. But it relieved us of so much agony down the road, and it facilitated, you know, so much success. And let me, let me move on to the next point, because after you hire smart, you respect the individual. Now there again, that sounds pretty pedestrian, but let me describe what I mean. At Dryers, if you came to work, we'd give you a business card. You'd have your name and your title on one side of the business card. You turn the card over, it would say company policy. Use your own best judgment at all times. That was it. That was our policy manual. We had a policy manual. It was about this big. It was a foot thick, and it sat on the desk, or actually on the coffee table of my CFO. All the pages were blank. We didn't have any policies. We trusted our people to do the right thing. And when you hire somebody who meets that test I just put forward, and you trust him to do the right thing, in my experience, he will never let you down. He or she will never let you down. People are so motivated by that. When you say to them, look, we want your whole person. We don't want you to hang up your personality at the reception desk when you come to work in the morning. We want you to decide how you can contribute. We're not going to give you a job description. We hire you because of your accomplishments. We want you to tell us how you think you can contribute. You've got to contribute. You've got to own something. You've got to, be, you've got to be famous for something around here. And this is a high performance organization, and your peers are going to be very demanding of you. But we assume that's what you want. And 
When you take that kind of an attitude toward people, I mean, it's so much the reverse of the way so many companies work. And you just say directly and indirectly, implicitly and explicitly, we trust you. You're now one of us. And we trust you to do the right thing. And by the way, our goal is to have you lying awake at night thinking about our problems, not your problems. Okay? We were very explicit about that. And I think we achieved it in many cases. But that leads me to maybe my most important point today. And that is the two most important words in the English language are you decide. You decide. There is so much trust implicit in that. If you're working for me and you come with an idea that pertains to your area of responsibility, and you say, Gary, here's what we're going to do, blah, blah, blah. And then I listen to you and I say, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Maybe I'm not so sure. Maybe I don't agree with you. What you expect at the end of that conversation is to me to say, okay, here's what we want you to do. And like a good employee, I mean, you go off and you do your best to make that work. But if it fails, you're going to say to yourself, if not to your coworkers, well, Gary made the decision. I didn't. Right? Yeah. But if I say to you at the end of that conversation, all right, we've talked this out now. We know where one another are on this issue. I want you to decide. It takes away all those excuses. It completely changes your, hit, your mind frame. Now you're responsible not only for the decision, but also for the outcome. And it sounds simple, but it is incredibly powerful. And it, it works not only in a business setting, it works in a personal setting. My wife is so tired of me saying, you decide. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we race to say, you decide. <laughs> and it's interesting, you don't want to be put in that position. I mean, we may want to go to a movie, and she wants to go see one movie, I want to go see another movie. I'll say, honey, you decide. And now she's really conflicted because she didn't want to drag me to some movie I don't want to see, but she really wants to see that movie. It's, 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 it's incredibly powerful. I remember one time after we inculcated this in the, in the culture of, the, of dryers, I was leaving the office. It was a holiday day, and, and many of the, it was the day before Thanksgiving or something, I think. And you know, many of the people had left the building by 3 o'clock when I was leaving. And the receptionist, as I walked by the receptionist, said, Gary, you know, we haven't had a phone call for an hour. Can I just put the switchboard over to the answering service and go home? You decide. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't specifically ask when I came to work the next Monday what she had done, but my assistant had been there late and said, you know, she stayed until the normal closing time, shut down that desk. Now, I can only speculate about what was going on in her head. But, it, but going back to our example, what was going on in her head was very different than if I had done what she expected me to do, which is to say, sure, go home because now she was in charge. So there's so much power in, you know, this be, be, gives you the underpinning of a really powerful culture. I don't have time. I, I could spend hours talking about the culture, but th these are the roots of it. And there's so much power in trust. And um, you have to really trust. You know, when I did that deal, <coughs> when we sold dryers, I went back to, I went, I went to Paris and I met the CEO of Nestle. And I, I met him at, you know, six o'clock at night in his, his hotel room. I, because I believe in preparing to be lucky, I got there a day early and I spent the day I was gonna meet with him walking the streets of Paris thinking if he says that, I'm gonna say this. And if he does this, I'm gonna do that. So I got to that hotel suite, I was so ready to negotiate that deal. And as part of the deal, we had to agree on what the price earnings ratio would be. And he had done his study or had his staff do his study and he, he thought he, he had tried to prove that for food companies in the US, about 12 times pre-tax earnings was the right price in those days. And I had an argument from my staff that said 13. So we very quickly came to 12 and a half. 
And then we had previously agreed on what the earnings basis, they were, they were buying out our profit plan three years in the future. So we took the earnings three years in the future and we applied it times that price earnings ratio and that's what they were going to pay us. That had been pre-agreed. Pre and they were going to pay us three years in the future. So he said, Gary, do you have a calculator? We have to get to, earn, we have to, get to a share price. I said, no, I don't have a calculator. He said, well, I don't have a calculator either. And he was tired. He'd been through two board meetings that day. I could tell he was really dragging. He said, well, I guess I'll have to calculate it by hand. And he, like me, is an engineer. So he, you know, he does the multiplication of the earnings times the PE, and then he draws a division sign. He says, how many shares are that? And I gave him that fact. And he did this division, and he had it kind of under his hand. And I knew where, of course, I, I was prepared. I knew where it was supposed to come out. I don't think he did. Because I knew it was like something around $75 a share. And I said, well, what's the answer? And he said, 80. And I said, 80 what? 83. I said, well, then do we have a deal at 83? And he stood up and shook my hand. That was a $400 million math error he made. <laughs> I, I, don't, I mean, even if I thought it was the right thing to correct him, I mean, I went back to the hotel room, and of course, and did that math, and I just, you know, it should have been up a bit at about 77. But he's a big boy, you know. I felt, you know, it's, it's responsible to let him make his own offer, and he offered E3. three. <laughs> sure as heck had a responsibility to my shareholders to accept it, right? Okay, so I get it on the airplane. I'm all pumped up. You know, this deal is in the hands of the lawyers now. We're going to announce it the following Monday. This was on a Tuesday. I fly back, and, and my whole staff, like the top 30 people at the Dryers, were in a, a retreat up at uh, Squaw Valley Resort. And they were planning strategy for the year, and they were doing plans and, you know, doing all this detailed work. And I knew that none of that work was any longer relevant. I mean... You know, Nestle was bringing haagen to this deal, and there were a lot of other complications of Nestle coming into our world. And, you know, whatever planning they were doing was going to be completely irrelevant. So what do you do? You know, you have this ethic of trust. But if, if you tell 30 people about something that isn't going to get announced publicly until next Monday, and if it leaks, you know it's going to blow the deal. That was, that was clear. Do you let them work the rest of the week? And you know, tell them the following Monday that all that work was for naught? Or do you tell them we just sold the company and, hey, you, know, you don't need to plan anymore this week? Any opinions on that? Give them what? Give them something else to do. <laughs> Go skiing or something? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, presumably you were under uh, a non-disclosure agreement. Yeah. To honor that agreement on one hand, and your fiduciary duty to your shareholders to honor that agreement. Secondarily, there are other factors to consider as we torpedo the deal. And if the deal were to fall through, you would need the productivity that you were observing to come through if the deal went through. So let it happen. Are you a <laughs> any, any other thoughts? I mean, I think this is one of those things where there's no right answer. But we had a, we had a culture based on trust. I mean, I couldn't face myself in the mirror, even though this was the biggest thing in my life. I couldn't let my staff work for three days, wasting their time, and, and face them the following Monday and say, you know, I let you do that. And here's why. I just couldn't do it. So that Wednesday morning, we cleared out the room. We got the hotel staff out of the room. And I stood up there in front of these 30 people. I said, you're not going to believe this. But two days ago, I sold the company to Nestle. And if any of you leak that, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I 
the following, the, the rest of the week went by. The stock didn't trade in any unusual way. We, we announced the deal on Monday. Nobody leaked it. No, it's, you may, you, you, I don't know, my, my rationale for that is you have to be who you are when the chips are down. No? Sometimes it's really tough. But if you don't trust your people when the trust really matters, you know, do you really trust them? And you don't do it for this reason, but the benefit you get from trusting people at that level is incredible. I mean, those people would do anything for me today because they know that when the chips were down, I took that big risk. Oops. All right. This was my partner's. I did all this with a partner, same partner I had in the restaurant business. Um, he used to say, you only go around a track once in life. You owe it to yourself to enjoy the journey. And I mean, those, those words are so important. You know, we are, there are no mulligans in life. We aren't going to have this day again. We might meet each other again. We might have a different conversation. But we aren't going to have this conversation again. So let's make it as good as it could possibly be. Life goes by fast. Believe me, I'm 73. I know. I mean, I've faced the Grim Reaper a couple times in my life. I had very serious brain surgery, and I recently had lymphoma, both of which you know, very easily could have killed me. So now I feel like I'm living on borrowed time. I'm not. I'm perfectly healthy. But, but you know, you get this sense that life is so precious because it can go away at any time. And I also have come to this conclusion that if you get the days right, if you get today right and tomorrow right, the weeks and the months and the years will take care of themselves. You know, I, we all have to have some direction. We all have to know what we're trying to achieve in a general sense. But I'm a, I say don't plan too specifically for yourself. Just make sure today is as good as it can possibly be. Love the people around you. Make time for your priorities. And if you keep doing that, I, I actually take a hot tub every single night. I go out there just before bed. I'm in the hot tub for 10 minutes. <clears throat> I only think about two things. And it's not being self-critical, really, but I, I will review the day. I'll be in that hot tub tonight in a couple hours. And I'll think, how did that class go today? If I were going to do it again, how would I do it differently? Did I leave anything out? All in a constructive way. And then I'll think about what's on for tomorrow. And I, I get great solace from that because I really feel like I'm focusing on the right things. And over the course of this busy career that you've heard about tonight, I, you know, I, I must say that I've made time. I mean, I've seen the world. I have 385 pins in my map outside of the United States, places I've been. That's a lot. My wife and I have been married for 52 years. We have four grown boys, you know, 11 grandchildren. And there have been a lot of things in our life other than what I've talked about tonight. So I, I, when people say, yeah, I can't, you know, you got to have a balanced life, you can't do both, baloney, you know? Your business can live without you for a couple of weeks. And you can a attend the other parts of your life that are important to you. And, you know, when you get to my age, you look back and you're just awfully glad you did. This is the last point. <clears throat> Be a builder. You know, I, I learned this in, in college on the crew. You know, the, the crew starts working out in August, and the first race isn't until April of the following year. So you row every day, sometimes twice a day, for nine months before you have any competition. That's crazy. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of really hard work. Why would you do that? It's because the joy is in the struggle. The joy is in the process. I mean, you come to appreciate that every workout is, is a 
opportunity to be maximized. You want to get better and better and better. But also, there's some competition there, which you learn to love. You know, the, the coach would set up these two boats, boat A and boat B. And he would try to make the boats fairly even. And you'd row a mile down the waterway, and maybe boat A was ahead of boat B by a length. He'd pull the boats together, and he'd say, change the four men, or the six men, or the five men, or whatever. And you'd go another mile. And maybe the order would change a little bit. And that would tell the coach who was making the boat go faster. But it also involved a lot of dynamics because both of those four men had to implicitly and completely trust everybody else in that boat or their hard work was just moving water around. Everybody in that boat had to work equally hard to have that be a fair test, right? But who knows is going to be the next guy to be switched, okay? But you learn to love the process. You learn to love the workout. You learn to love the struggle. So it's about the doing. It's not about the having. And I've left on your chair a, a poem by Rudyard Kipling that really captures this idea. It's a story of a king who late in life decides to build himself a palace, a, a munificent palace. And he calls his workmen in from the fields, and, and he says, let's go out and start digging up the the ground for our foundations. And they come across the palace of an earlier king, which has been covered in the dirt. And his workmen come to the king and they say, you know, this guy inscribed on some of the stones of his palace, after me cometh a builder. Tell him I too have known. The king thinks about that, sends the workmen back out to keep building his palace. And a couple weeks later, his doctor comes to him and says, you're stricken, you're going to die. You're going to die before your palace is finished. The king thinks about that a little bit, and he calls his workmen back in from the fields, and he says, inscribe on the stones of my palace. After me cometh a builder. Tell him I too have known. So when I look back at my life, and lessons learned, you know, the stories I've told you about the issues we face, the people that we brought in, the struggles we had, the ups, the downs, that's the real joy of life. And yes, we earned a lot of money, and yes, you know, we were the biggest ice cream company in the United States, but you know, that, that stuff doesn't really matter in the final analysis. It's, it's, it's who you are and what the process has done to you while you've been doing the process. And I really think that's a great lesson to ponder. So thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you. I always enjoy being with the Davis School of Management. <laughs>